Cash with the National Dropout Prevention Center, and I'm here with my co-host and colleague, Marty Duckenfield, also with the center, and we welcome all of you to this monthly radio webcast brought to you by the National Dropout Prevention Center at Clemson University in partnership with the Clemson Radio Productions and the generous support of Penn Foster. Welcome again to Solutions. We're delighted to have you with us. Uh, if you were here last month, welcome back. And for those of you who are, this is new today, welcome to this live broadcast focusing on solutions to the dropout crisis. We had a lot of interest with our first program, and this is very exciting, and we're happy to have you all joining us today for today's live broadcast. I'd like to remind our listeners uh, of the materials that have been provided for you on the website for today's program. First of all is a slide presentation, which is, in fact, a PowerPoint to support the discussion for today. Secondly, there are PDFs for each of the actual resources and tools that will be explained for your use after the broadcast and also for during the broadcast today. And finally, there are some organization website links that you can look at for follow-up after the program today. We want to encourage you to be an active part of our program today And so please call in your questions for our guest. We have a toll-free number. It's 888-539-8859. And if you're calling outside the U.S., the number is 864-656-4550. You can begin calling in now uh, or any time during the program. We'll put you on hold for a few minutes, but we'll try and get to as many of you and your questions as we can during the broadcast. Uh, students report a wide variety of reasons for dropping out of school. Therefore, the, uh, the solutions to the dropout, uh, dropout issue are, must be multidimensional as well. There are significant push and pull factors that impact whether or not a student will walk out or stay in school and graduate. This webcast will focus on the essential components necessary for establishing and maintaining quality learning environments for all children. Dr. Ray Morley, our guest today, has had a successful career over 35 years in dropout prevention. Dr. Morley is an adjunct faculty member at the University of Northern Iowa, Cedar Falls, Iowa, and recently retired as a consultant in the Iowa Department of Education responsible for dropout prevention programs uh, and services for high school dropouts, at-risk programs, education of homeless children, and youth and school-based youth services and programs. He's published over 50 manuscripts, including books and pamphlets and state guidelines and legislation and curriculum guides and et cetera, journal articles. He was a member of the initial group to establish a national organization dedicated to the alternative education, which has evolved into the International Association for Learning Alternatives, IALA. He serves on the board of directors for IALA as well as the Iowa Association for Alternative Education. Uh, Though Dr. Morley is best known for his work in alternative education domain, he'll be quick to tell you that he believes in alternatives for everyone. Ray, we're very delighted to have you join our webcast today. Hey, glad to be here, Terry. Well, thank you, Ray. And we'll uh, uh, we'll, be sharing with us some resources and tools that will enable students to be more successful in school. Uh, Your goal is personalization of learning environments. Uh, perhaps we can start by your telling us a bit more about that and then introduce us to the first tool. Uh, we'll then begin to field our questions, um, call in questions after you explain the first tool. And again, that number is toll free, 888 539 8859. And for those calling outside the U.S., it's 864 656 4550. Yeah, Terry. Uh First, I'd like to begin with uh, a compliment to uh, Dr. Stephen Edwards last month. Uh, I think uh, his coming forth as a principal uh, and sharing his ideas on what he felt would be successful in uh, helping all kids uh, become uh, more highly educated than uh, what the plan would be right now is just incredibly important. Uh, we need people like that to share ideas so that we can all be successful with uh, children. Uh, I'd like to also say that uh, the National Dropout Prevention Center really serves as a, an incredible resource for people to search and identify ideas that will help them succeed with all students. So every once in a while, I just figure you folks need to uh, raise your arm in the air and turn your palm to the rear and bend your elbow and give yourselves a pat on the back because uh, you have an incredible center, uh, lots of information to share with folks, 
And we continue to promote your center uh, with our people that we work with uh, to gain even more ideas about what to do to help. Um, Thank you. Last Mark. month, yeah, it's, a, it's an incredible center, and, uh, and you, you need to be proud of what you're doing. Um, last month, Dr. Edwards identified the role of school administrators, uh, you know, with his seven key principles. And, and Dr. Edwards uh, emphasized uh, that we really need to closely examine our existing school pro- policies and procedures. Uh, in order to be successful with students because uh, policies and procedures sometimes get in the way of us uh, to be successful with students. And he he really identified that uh, we need to collect some data on our own policies and procedures uh, within our own schools as a key principle for being successful. And he also emphasizing personalizing the school and making uh, relationships between students and staff a priority. Uh, if we don't do that, uh, we can't be as successful with students. And he also uh, felt that we needed to create options and alternatives for students in the academic as well as uh, non-academic areas. And uh, we've heard a lot about academic area improvement and whatever. It's the non-academic uh, areas that uh, sometimes get in the way. Uh, he really wanted us to all be proactive in this arena uh, to get things going in those seven key principles. And so what I wanted to follow up with today basically was some tools that uh, people can use to do some of the things that Dr. Edwards identified in his suggestions for school administrators. So uh, hopefully these tools uh, can get us on the way with those key ideas. And uh, second thing I want to accomplish today is to really get after the issue of involving students in discovering what it will take to help them succeed. Uh, Students have a lot of incredible ideas and can help uh, the professional educators if they just relax a little bit and let the students be a part of the process. So today, uh, what I wanted to get after, if the, if the folks are tuned in and uh, got the slideshow up and whatever, to move to the second slide after the introduction, where I've uh, got two sides to the story of that risk, basically. Uh, there's two sides to the at-risk story, and that is challenges that children bring to school, which we talk about a lot. But then there's what schools do to contribute to student failure. And that's the second side of the story, which we're going to start out with today with regard to looking at policies and procedures uh, that might be getting away uh, in the way of students succeeding in school. So that's what that uh, second slide is all about there. Um, to go to the third slide, uh, you see that uh, identifying negative policies and practices, you have to have uh, some kind of guidance in order to get into this arena. And uh, I believe that that's an incredible uh, recommendation that uh, Stephen Edwards made, and it's a work that we've really done a lot with. Uh, We feel that uh, teachers really need to do a self-review on policies and procedures. Uh, The administrators of schools need to do that. Parents need to be involved in that process to help uh, practitioners identify where the problems are. Students can be involved in that process. And uh, service agencies and organizations in the community can be involved with that process. So the first tool that we're going to take a look at basically is uh, a recommended tool that can be used by all these groups of uh, folks who may get involved with this uh, principle, if you will, of identifying policies and practices related to student failure and dropping out. If you go to the the next slide, uh, self-review tool, uh, you'll see it. It's policies and practices related to student failure and dropping out. Uh, This tool is on the uh, website for uh, Iowa Association of Alternative Education. And uh, basically the the tool has been used uh, many times over since it was first put together in a number of research studies uh, that have been conducted to see whether the results would come out the same. We're testing the reliability and validity of the instrument basically itself. 
Uh, the uh, results that we get from the tool have been repeated uh, over and over again. Um, what I'd like to indicate to folks who have looked at this tool or may look at this tool that uh, the inventory was developed to uh, serve as a working tool uh, to help school districts and agencies review existing policies and practices in six different areas of schooling. And the six areas are instruction, discipline, support services, attendance, student activities, and school community relations. The format of the inventory and the way it's laid out identifies a policy or procedure that might be in place. The potential negative effect of that policy or procedure on students. And then the instrument provides a possible alternative to that policy or practice. It allows the user to identify whether or not the policy or practice is uh, perceived as a problem in their district, and then what action could possibly be taken to overcome that policy or procedure. Uh, the whole idea here uh, that we had was to see how many were actually uh, in place, and we identified over 50 policies and practices that uh, contribute to negative uh, student success versus positive. Um, we have recommended in the front end of the instrument, uh, if you go to that, uh, that local administrators and school board members uh, can be involved in taking a look at policies and practices by using that inventory if they know anything about what's going on in the district. Uh, as well as the other professionals, uh, parents, business people in the community, and community agencies. So the questionnaire uh, is well designed for multiple different kinds of people to look at the school, come to conclusions about what's there and isn't there, and then maybe come up with some goals, if you will, to uh, take care of the, the problems that may be there. <clears throat> The inventory, too, has a questionnaire on pages 21 to 22, which uh, involves students. Uh, it's a questionnaire that can be administered the way it is, or you can change it, whatever way you'd uh, like to do. Uh, but the questionnaire allows students to identify policies and procedures, and we've administered this to hundreds of students in Iowa uh, from alternative schools as well as uh, regular high schools and middle schools. And uh, we've come out with very, very similar results. Uh, it wouldn't make any difference if you had a dropout uh, filling it out or a student who might be talented and gifted within a given high school. Um, so what we're uh, uh, interested in is that people have this tool in hand to follow through with Stephen Edwards' recommendation to look at policies and procedures in their own school districts. Uh, if you uh, want from me, Terry, I can move into what we found is the top ten student concerns, or uh, if you have a question at this point, I'll stop and we can intervene. Well, uh, thank you, Ray, for that for that overview. And certainly, policies and practices uh, sometimes get. Uh, gets overlooked in terms of what we're doing with regard to uh, making our schools uh, uh, healthy environments for kids. And I think this is a great tool. It's an important place to start with this. And I, w I would just like to uh, to maybe while uh, give our, our callers a chance to maybe call in, I have a question for you on this. But in, in the interim, um, and I, you said this, but I'd like to emphasize, if you could emphasize, that this tool could also be used at the classroom level. Is that correct? It's not just for uh, administrators and district level and school boards, et cetera. Yeah, what, what I really like about it is when you get the input from the students, um, that the input from the students would uh, really um, identify what the power of the teacher in the classroom is. It brings out the, the identity of what a teacher is really uh, all about and the importance of that teacher to a given student. Uh, sometimes I, I just get the feeling that, that uh, teachers may be uh, overlooked a little bit as we try to go about administering schools. Mm -hmm. And uh, really, uh, when it comes down to it, students actually see the teacher as an incredible person in their lives. 
and uh, the results that come from that uh, would indicate that um, seven of the top ten concerns that kids have about schooling uh, is all about their classroom experience with teachers. Well, let, let's look at those uh, things that you found, the top ten student concerns, because there are very many that have a whole lot of association with teachers and the, and the power and influence that they have, Ray. You want to go over those with us now? Sure. Yeah, if you uh, go to the next slide uh, in the presentation, uh, you'll see the top ten student concerns. I've got five on, on each slide. So uh, as we look at these, though, uh, remember that these are in prioritized order. Uh, so if you were going to administer this to students, uh, the greatest number of students would probably come out with the, the first uh, criticism, and that is about teacher lecturing. Uh, they don't get enough variety in the, in the methodology uh, to learn, and at the high school level in particular, there's an incredible amount of teacher lecturing versus uh, using any other methodology. So these are in prioritized order. Um, the second one is uh, no adjustment to the way that I learn. Uh, basically, they continue to go on with their own methodology and don't ask me uh, where I'm at or identify uh, how I can learn best. Uh, lack of interest in the student attendance. Uh, the students would tell us uh, most uh, folks would care less of whether they're there or not. Uh, you come to school to learn, so you better show up or forget it. Um, there's a, uh, a lack of belonging. Uh, basically, students don't feel like they belong in a classroom after a period of time. Overwhelming homework. Uh, they uh, get assignments to uh, do uh, continuously, whether they've uh, accomplished the, the first assignment or not. And so they get overwhelmed with that. Uh, lack of rewards. Uh, some students would tell me, uh, you yeah, know, I began work and I really tried hard and I still get a D. <laughs> yeah. uh, for my work, so uh, it's uh, the point where I give up. Uh, lack of caring about uh, student work. Uh, uh, some teachers care less of whether I get it in or not, or if I get it in, um, I, I find out that I really don't have to, and I can <laughs> still get by. A uh, little individual help. If I ask uh, for help in the classroom, I, really there isn't any time or much time for me to get any help, so I really don't get any. Overwhelming full schedule of classes. Um, a lot of students will tell us uh, they're getting three Fs and two Ds and whatever, uh, and they still have to take that full schedule of classes, uh, even though they can't quite uh, come up to snuff with that. And uh, unfair punishment, uh, boys and girls in particular being treated differently, uh, students from different socioeconomic groups being treated differently. So those are uh, the top ten student concerns that normally will show up uh, in any questionnaire that we've administered uh, in any school. And, and so I, uh, you can see those uh, out of that top ten, there's seven that deal directly with that classroom. And I can tell you when we spend time in schools and talk to students, these are the same topics they come up with them. So it seems uh, nice to kind of have you validate what we're hearing from the students today. Now, we'll take a minute to just remind the uh, listeners that we welcome your questions as well. Terry and I have a list a mile long, and we may monopolize uh, Dr. Morley, but we'd like to share him with you. Our toll-free number is 888-539-8859, and uh, we have the toll-free, the uh, not the toll-free number, the outside the U.S. number is 864-656-4550. Uh, Terry, what's next? Um, well, I'd just like to go back and uh, Ray. When I first looked, took a look at your uh, top ten student concerns, when I saw the lack of rewards, uh, immediately I was wondering about that. What were you going with that in terms of rewards? And I think you cleared it up in sort of an intrinsic uh, notion of rewards. But what has been your, um, uh, I guess, your take on how effective? Uh, you know, external rewards would be with kids. Uh, uh, is that something that uh, uh, that you've had some experience with, particularly in an alternative environment? Well, yeah, one of the uh, um, things we've worked with a lot with students is seeds of promise. Uh, students have really got to feel like uh, they can learn, uh, that you have the confidence that uh, they will learn, and uh, that comes through the, what you say to them. Uh, how you treat them, and uh, it also would come through external rewards mm -hmm. uh, that might be provided for them. 
the key thing about students is when they actually do try uh, to do work and whatever, they, needed, uh, they need to see uh, what they've accomplished well and, and be recognized for that. Uh, as well as what they haven't been accomplished uh, so well. Uh, the key thing is that there has to be some promise in their effort, mm-hmm. and uh, that's the way we uh, get success going is we uh, get them involved with something that they can be successful with and then build on that success and expand it out. If there's no reward uh, in the process or very little, uh, then the students get continue to be discouraged and don't go toward success. They'll go toward the other way. Uh, Ray, yeah, exactly. Uh, The next tool seems pretty important, examining the basic beliefs of your school staff. Uh, How about explaining this tool to our listeners for us? Yeah, the uh, second tool uh, we developed uh, for folks to involve children uh, is called Restructuring Education by Listening to Involving Our Children. And uh, when I worked with uh, teachers uh, throughout the state, uh, we started using uh, four basic questions uh, that came out of research, uh, action research, basically, and uh, decided that we were going to get input from our students in our classrooms to see what we might be able to change as teachers uh, to help students be more successful. Of course, the key point here, again, is looking at uh, local policies and procedures that may contribute to student failure and dropping out. And a good way to get at that is by asking students some basic questions. Uh, the next slide uh, that we have in the presentations identify the four questions that we used in the action research. I have to indicate to you that when we first started out with this, uh, we had over 100 teachers involved with this uh, questioning process with students and we uh, questioned over 500 students from elementary, middle, uh, and high schools uh, within Iowa, and most of those students were high-risk uh, students who weren't necessarily succeeding very well in school. And uh, the four questions are, uh, what do teachers do that makes a good day for you at school? And what happens in school that gives you a feeling that you've accomplished something? What happens in school that makes it a good day for you with classmates? And what happens in school that makes it a good day with you with friends? Uh, Now, um, the results that we get from children and the answers that they provide to these questions supports what you would naturally see in research studies that that come out to us. Uh, We see a lot of research studies, for instance, that say that uh, classmates uh, really should be in groups and do group learning, cooperative learning, if you will. Well, children will actually say they learn best when they're working in a group, and they love working with their classmates in that kind of a setting. Um, Another kind of thing you'll see show up in research is uh, involving students in leadership to learn how to be a leader. Um, for a lot of kids in schools, they're never asked to be a leader. Uh, and one of the things that they'll say about what happens in schools that makes it uh, uh, a day where you've really accomplished something, uh, that's the day that they've been asked to be a leader uh, in one activity or another. Uh, that's an incredible uh, response from students on that. So what we've done with the, the uh, responses from students on this uh, questionnaire, uh, these four questions, is we've broken them down into elementary school, middle school, and high school responses. And then we did a combined uh, response that, uh, lo- that uh, included all, elementary, middle, and high school. What we found out from this is that uh, it doesn't make any difference <laughs> pretty much at what level you're working with. The responses are going to come back very much the same about what they would like to see of a teacher in the classroom or what uh, they would like to do in terms of working with their classmates. Uh, so what this has done basically to us is, is allows the children to identify what they want from a teacher But it's up to the teacher to follow through and to personalize the experience and then let the students know when they're following through with what the children ask for in terms of what the teacher is to do. Um, When that happens, 
Um, that's a powerful experience for students because they know the teacher really cares and that they're going to do something to uh, modify the experience to, to help them be successful. So the kids can, uh, if you take a look at the responses that we've included in the tool, four people here, uh, you'll see uh, very solid recommendations for teachers uh, and administrators to follow through uh, with students uh, to provide an education that uh, they feel would be most important to them, and that would become a powerful thing for them to help students stay in school, want to be there, and to do their best. Well, um, I agree, uh, Ray, and um, I'm going to take a moment now to give out our toll-free number again for those callers who may want to ask you a question. That toll-free number is 888-539-8859. If you're calling outside the United States, it's 864-656-4550. And I couldn't agree with you. The relationship, uh, relationship piece of the puzzle is often overlooked in light of the pressure for administrators and teachers with NCLB mandates, and, and often um, uh, I think that's what, uh, when you talk with kids, they would suggest that, um, yeah, no one just really cared. And I think you're, that's exactly what you're addressing here with this. The next tool refers to quality indicators for alternative education. Um, do these principles also apply to regular classrooms? And, and tell us about this resource. Yeah, um, a while uh, back, uh, we had uh, developed in, in, in Iowa uh, alternative learning environments, what we call alternative learning environments. These were alternative schools as well as programs and uh, coordinated services in local school districts to serve at-risk uh, student populations. And uh, we were looking at high risk as well as low risk uh, in the development of these programs throughout the state. We developed uh, a financial process to allow local school districts to accommodate students uh, uh, who they identified as being at risk of not succeeding in school, uh, not completing school, or not being successful upon leaving school. So that's how at risk was defined, basically. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, what we uh, journeyed out to do in the framework uh, was to get input from teachers and administrators who were involved with programs that identified uh, successful practices in terms of the outcomes they were having with students. Uh, we were reducing the dropout rate. We were keeping students in school. We were graduating students who had dropped out of school. And we wanted to know what the basic beliefs were of the people who were part of those programs because that seemed to be a key ingredient to why they were succeeding. So we uh, set out to develop a, a framework, if you will, of the basic beliefs uh, that people had in these programs that helped them be successful. And uh, what we ended up uh, doing is working on this for about two and a half years <laughs> to uh, get uh, a lot of input from a lot of people uh, and then try to document that in some purposeful way so that we could uh, give this information to other people who were planning on developing programs so that they could be successful in keeping kids in school. And we broke uh, that framework um, that uh, we have, uh, which is uh, part of our slide presentation there, Framework for Learning Alternative Environments in Iowa. Learning alternative environments uh, refers to programs as well as alternative schools uh, in this whole thing. So it applies uh, in that kind of a framework, Terry. Okay. The, uh, the um, way it's busted down, the framework itself, is broken down into four major categories as you get into it. And the whole idea of the basic beliefs idea is if you've got new staff who are coming into a program, it's very healthy for you to review with that staff what their beliefs are about education. Because if they don't believe in the framework that you're trying to lay out to be successful with kids, if they aren't quite there, Maybe the best thing is that they don't serve in that program. Um, and I would recommend to any administrator working with staff in a program that they really take some time to sit back, look at what they really believe, 
in a pro about kids and learning and whatever in the program uh, because they may not fit real well with what it is that you're trying to get done. Um, th- it's very important that there's a match between um, what the students would expect uh, in a program and what the staff really believe in and can deliver. It doesn't take long for a student to pick up from a teacher that they don't really believe that they can learn. Exactly. It's very, very clear to a student. Um, and um, so what this does is it gives people a tool uh, to take a look at themselves, basically, in, these, in this kind of a, um, a layout. We've got the layout in the four areas of being the purpose, student focus, staff focus, and then management and support focus. Uh, these are uh, basic management things that are part of all schooling, basically. And what the, the framework represents is uh, research and experience-based synopsis of, uh, of basic ideas that uh, people have in learning environments that are successful in reaching kids. Uh, the content of the framework um, again, came from a broad number of people in Iowa. And then what we did is we sent it out across the United States. We said, take a look at these and uh, provide us more input. And we uh, went to California, to New York, to all over the place uh, to try to uh, get more ideas and edit this out and bring it down to what we would call a working format. On page four of the format itself, uh, it really recognizes uh, what alternative education really represents. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a program and it's not a school. It's really a perspective on how you look at education mm-hmm. and work with kids within education. And so uh, the instrument is meant to get after what your perspective really is and what you really believe in. Um, if you took a look at page five, it, it really gets after what we intended about alternative education it recognizes that everyone does not learn in the same way, shouldn't have to be taught in the same way, and it accepts that really all schools uh, don't have to be alike uh, in establishing learning environments. Uh, I know there's a lot of security in that for administrators, but uh, there's a lot of research would tell us that perhaps if you got eight elementary schools in your district, maybe all eight ought to be different not the same. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a recognition of individuality in learning in this framework, which Stephen Edwards really uh, got into a lot. If we're going to look at uh, learning, then we really have to look at it from an individual, personal perspective versus one-size-fits-all, curriculum first, student second kind of thing. And uh, my perspective on personalizing the programming for students is we need to look at the paradigm that we presently have uh, in educational programming of being curriculum first, student second. There's many indicators (laughs) that are going on in school improvement that would support that, that our framework is actually that versus student first, curriculum second. Uh, As we look at the successful beliefs of people in programming, it would come down to they, they look at the student first, and work from there. You know, and the, then the curriculum comes second, and they can move them into curriculum, and they can be incredibly successful. So the paradigm shift is student first, curriculum second. I think this paradigm shift is one of the great contributions that the world of alternative education has given to um, education at large. And this paradigm shift is uh, the, the ground is starting to shake. But I think many listeners probably know of alternative schools that are the places where you send the bad kids, and it's a punishment or it's you're there for two months or a semester or whatever. But alternative education is so much more, and I think the lessons that you all have been involved with for how many years, Ray, that you've been involved are really forcing and driving the hand of making things change Throughout education, it's really kind of the leading force in education reform today. Uh, yeah, if you, uh, I just did a um, an article on comparing the new things that are being recommended for school change mm-hmm. and the basic police of alternative educators. Those are incredible 
parallel <laughs> mm-hmm. and correlation between the major ideas of alternative ed and what's being recommended now for school improvement. So uh, we're all encouraged, the people of alternative ed, looking at this whole arena of school improvement uh, seems to, to be moving in the right direction if we could actually get it to, you know, into use. Mm-hmm. So people need a lot of tools to do that. Right. And, mm-hmm. I, and I think also, I mean, the curriculum is so important, of course, and many people do go into <coughs> teaching, particularly in the secondary level, where they teach uh, something that they love, whether it's Spanish or science or uh, history. They love it, and it shows. But, um, but, but to turn that paradigm or to reach those kids, yes, you can teach what you love, but you can also... Uh, think about students coming first and hey there's someone besides terry and me who wants to ask you a question uh no, wayne good. from st paul minnesota we are delighted you've called and we've been looking forward to hearing from you do you have a question or comment for ray morley yes it's uh, hi ray this is uh, very good material you're giving us and uh, i like that idea of the student first curriculum second could you uh, expand on that just a little bit and say what that means in uh, in practice, you know, what schools should do differently? Well, uh, we've been focusing on a few things, Wayne. Uh, when, when we get into schooling uh, with students and we've got a policy in place, uh, for instance, that uh, asks all students to take a full class load at the uh, middle school level, uh, means they take six classes a day. Uh, whether they succeed in those classes or not, it doesn't make any difference. They have to take a full load of classes. Uh, that, uh, that policy could be really modified, and uh, we could get to the student first where we want to create success and um, uh, have alternatives for students so that instead of a full class load, they might only take uh, two courses uh, become successful in those and then expand out to three courses, four courses, and, and then uh, go on to a successful uh, experience. It's that kind of a modification uh, specifically that I would be talking about in terms of looking at student first, uh, curriculum second. Does that give you a, enough a specific example or you want more? Uh, I think we've lost uh, Wayne. I think Wayne probably is, was listening oh, okay. to your response. Uh, again, our toll-free number is 888-539-8859. And outside the U.S., it's 864-656-4550. We would be delighted to, uh, if you have comments or questions for Dr. Morley, we'd be delighted uh, to hear from you. Um, uh, Ray, I think I'm going to move uh, again to if you would weave in uh, a little bit about your rubric for quality indicators, your checklist of quality indicators, if you will, uh, for alternative learning environments. Could you take us briefly through that and, uh, and discuss it, please? Yeah, when uh, when uh, we looked at the uh, framework of basic beliefs in alternative education, um, we decided uh, that needed to be expanded out so that we could look at programs in a more specific fashion uh, that were already laid out and also to have some kind of a guideline for people who were uh, jumping into developing new programs. So what we did uh, was uh, set out to try to take the basic beliefs and to break them out even more specifically into a uh, a rubric, if you will, that could be used to evaluate existing programs and to serve as a outline uh, for new program development. And uh, what we ended up with, after we worked with the uh, basic police, coming out of the basic police, we ended up with 11 uh, areas uh, that we built a checklist on, uh, and uh, this checklist uh, dealt with uh, the philosophy, the working philosophy. You have your program, administration of the program, uh, student uh, focused on the program, parents and guardian involvement, uh, staff involvement, curriculum and instruction, assessment, personal and social skills, community and social services, uh, facilities, and then we ended up the format with uh, signals that uh, your learning alternative may not be successful, which came out of research uh, Marianne Raywood was uh, involved with out of New York, 
as well as other people. And uh, she did a lot in terms of um, boiling down the research in that arena. So what this ended up being then was if uh, you as an administrator, teacher, a coordinator, whatever, wanted to have some kind of guideline to come up with a school improvement plan, um, we always encouraged uh, anyone who gets involved with drop-off prevention, services for drop-offs and whatever, that it isn't, uh, that you develop a program and then you're finished. It's That program has to continually change because your student population changes. And if it's truly student-focused, that you have to be continuously looking at how you can improve uh, your areas as you're moving along. And it's so easy to get lost in the woods because there's so much that you have to keep track of in programming that you have to have a tool of some kind that you're working on that keeps you focused on goals that you need to accomplish before you move on to the next and so forth. Uh, So the quality indicators became a checklist, if you will, uh, for folks to develop school improvement plans to come up with quality. If we were going to work on alternative schools, as Marty was bringing up earlier, then we ought to be looking at quality schools uh, and quality programs for students, and this will allow people to get at that area of quality, and it's all supported by existing research if you uh, take a look at what's being recommended now in school yeah. improvement arena. This, this is a terrific tool, and guess what? We've got some people who are interested in this particular item, I think, or some others that you've had to say. And So Dale has been holding for a couple minutes. We appreciate it. Dale from Austin, Texas. Uh, you're on the air. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Morley. Very, very interesting stuff. I'm really interested in, in what you're saying about um, a couple of things. First, um, uh, having students express their ideas about the curriculum and the, the kind of instruction they're getting sounds sounds wonderful. My problem when I've seen that happen is that sometimes teachers are sort of dismissive of that input, and I'm wondering if you have ideas about how to make that more palatable and how to make how to get teachers uh, to listen to that. And then along with that, um, you started to talk about um, teachers and their philosophy. What if you have teachers that um, you need to work with and you can't ask them to go teach somewhere else and you need to consider helping them get a better worldview and a different perspective on all students can learn? First of all, uh, um we need to be encouraging of all teachers. Uh, one of the most powerful things you can do with a teacher is identify all the neat things that they do do. And then to uh, identify that for other teachers as well. And then to encourage them to share their ideas together. Uh, so encourage, 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 and coach <laughs> uh, would be a, a good line you know, to follow in that arena of trying to bring teachers along. Uh, many administrators have found that it's a very difficult chore uh, to do that, but the most successful has been on uh, successful coaching, that is um, identifying their strengths and uh, bringing them along with the idea that they could maybe help out with a new idea or ideas that the other teachers are trying and they need somebody else to help them. And they've been identified as perhaps somebody who can do that. So in essence, you're bringing them along as maybe being a leader (laughs) Um, and experimenting with something that um, might be uh, successful for them. Uh, So encouragement, encouragement, encouragement is a good thing to follow. Sometimes, um, uh, no matter what you do in that arena, uh, they're just not buying in uh, to what it is that you're trying to do. And um, when they aren't buying in uh, to that kind of a thing, uh, the question becomes, uh, would they want to be uh, maybe um, maybe uh, more uh, successful in another school or another environment and, you know, coach them accordingly uh, without trying to be too negative uh, with that arena. What was your first part of your question, by the way? I, I was asking about teachers' responses to student input, and I, I've seen them. Oh, okay. I, I, I value, I mean, it, it can be very informative, but... It seems like sometimes uh, teachers are sort of taken aback that, that students would have an opinion that would be germane or pertinent to, to their work. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, we've had a lot of discussions with teachers, and, and uh, some of them get pretty hot uh, in terms of what the students are saying. But 
Uh, the key thing is uh, once you get uh, student input on a questionnaire, uh, to have the teachers come together and take a look what the students are saying, basically. And when you get uh, out of your student population, if you had 100 students and 90 of them are saying, you know, we're, we're, we uh, simply um, would like to see uh, the teachers provide more individual assistance, uh, you know, for us to be able to be able to succeed, uh, that's something that perhaps you ought to be looking at, you know, uh, seriously. Um, sometimes uh, the the the, um, the uh, question becomes, okay, if we have this input from the student, then what is what is it that we need to do that? <laughs> What's the next step um, that that we could take a look at to see if it would make any difference for the students? So it's good that uh, you as an administrator um, would provide the teachers then some ideas about uh, or get the teachers involved in a discussion about ideas then of what we could do uh, that would provide uh, the students what they're asking for. Well, thank you. Dale? And then to collect that information. Dale, uh, thank you for your call because uh, what's coming on next is, is this next step, Ray, and we have Lois calling from Seattle who is concerned about what the teachers can do. Lois, you're on the air uh, with Dr. Morley. Thank you. Um, about seven out of the ten um, indicators from students you mentioned had to do with the classroom and teachers. Um, I understand trying to reform current schools, but what are you doing with teacher education programs to train the teachers from a cert, you know, at the beginning instead of having to go back and change practice? Yeah, what we're... Um what we're trying to get going uh, uh, within the country, basically, <laughs> uh, worldwide, is a um, program for teacher training that uh, brings this information forward to them. And uh, in you could uh, specialize as a teacher in alternative learning programs, uh, alternative schools, uh, kind of a training uh, effort. Uh, the other thing that uh, we've been doing is uh, participating in uh, all the the uh, teacher training institutions now are are getting involved with uh, teacher quality, and uh, there's a number, a whole a list of um, of research projects that have been put together on teacher dispositions and the importance of that in the learning of students, and that's being brought forward in the universities and colleges uh, to. Look at this in arena of training for teachers as well as uh, where we've been. Uh, so there is effort going on now. And um, we just posted on the uh, IAAE website under research. Uh, I think it's there right now. It's just really recent. Uh, the research on teacher dispositions and what's going on with universities and colleges. Um, so that effort is on the way. There's a lot of work that has to be done with that. You're bringing up an incredibly uh, good point in terms of when it is then that a teacher gets this in their training program. Well, I think I think also that um, you know this isn't just for alternative education. A lot of what you're talking about is evident in mainstream high school classrooms as well. It's not. I just agree. The alternative mm -hmm. schools. So, you know, this means, you know, all, and this is true of all of a lot of ed reform issues and, and strategies of working with students and and um, bringing relevancy and relationship into their education. That, you know, if the teacher ed programs are ten years behind us, you know, we're in a catch twenty two, and you don't have teachers been trained to do and work with students the way. They're asking to be worked with. Yes, um, the uh, one of the reasons um, we put together the International Association of Learning Alternatives uh, was to bring forward uh, the best practices in programming uh, for students that uh, cause students to be successful. And that could and that wasn't just an alternative program, but uh, we talked about alternative learning. Um, practices and instructional practices and management practices and so forth. What our whole intent was of having a, a learning organization was to get the information out to people whether they were in a teacher training program or not, mm -hmm. um, to get uh, have that 
information accessible through IALA, um, and um, as well in Iowa, we have the Iowa Association of Alternative Ed, but IALA was developed uh, to work on mainstream initiatives as well as alternative schools and programs. Well, one thing for uh, so sure. So I'd just like to emphasize the, the importance of that resource as well as the National Dropout Prevention Center. Thank you, Ray. And Lois, you brought a, a terrific question to the table here uh, as far as involving teacher education programs in K-12 and getting us all to work together and try to head this off before teachers are placed in schools. Thank you for calling so much. We have some more callers. This seems to happen every time we get them fast and furious at the end. And we want to make sure we all uh, get everybody a chance to call. So we have Vivian, who's calling from Richmond, Virginia. And Vivian, thank you for holding. And I imagine you have a question or concern for, uh, that you'd like to share with Dr. Morley. Well, two. One, um, the best way to use the checklist for indica- the quality indicators, I'm thinking about regular ed as well as um, the alternative learning environment. And the other question is that I'm trying to, I made a copy of it, and it's not readable. It's in, like it's in hieroglyphic. Oh. Well, yeah. now, I'll tell you what, Vivian. Okay. Um, you email us, and we will take care of this for you. Okay. And for others out there who are having uh, problems with anything, our email address is ndpc, as in National Dropout Prevention Center, at clemson.edu. And you write to us, and we'll uh, we'll, help, we'll help you out with that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Vivian, hieroglyphics doesn't help too much. No, it <laughs> doesn't help. <laughs> we, we no, have... it doesn't. <laughs> so we'll, we'll get we'll get you straight on that, and I think once you get it, you're going to be really glad you have it. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a terrific yeah. tool. Uh, Let and... me get at uh, your first point, though. Uh, uh, we have uh, been working with the school improvement people. Uh, in Iowa who go out and do visitations in all school districts throughout the state and uh, have a a highly uh, correlated um, piece of paper put together that they look at seven basic uh, things when they go out and look at school improvement initiatives. And the uh, quality indicators list is very closely aligned with that. the, The difference is... The perspective. <laughs> uh, the perspective of the quality indicators is student first, uh, curriculum second, and the perspective from the other way is a lot more curriculum only mm-hmm. and not much on student stuff. Uh, so we're trying to uh, get, um, and what we've done is scheduled administrator meetings uh, with the school improvement people and the alternative learning people uh, so that we could create, if you will, a school improvement initiative that would be more uh, in line with the uh, paradigm, if you will. So uh, there's a lot of work going on in that area uh, regarding your question. And the quality indicators are very much in tune with with, uh, six major educational organizations across the country, and this includes the International Association of Learning Alternatives now, which would make seven, I have come uh, really uh, together to look at what needs to be changed in NCLB, and uh, a lot of the changes being recommended would be more in line with the paradigm student first, curriculum second idea, and hopefully uh, down the line uh, that will change and we will be moving forward uh, in this uh, whole arena, <laughs> which is big time. But yeah. I just want to indicate to you that uh, there's a lot, there is work going on in that, that sector. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you, Vivian. Uh, we have another caller, and then we're going to um, we'll take this one call, and then we'll go to the last uh, tool that you provided, Ray. But we have Gail mm-hmm. from Forest Lake, Minnesota, probably where it's snowing or something. Hey, Gail. Welcome to Solutions. Hi, My question for you, Dr. Morley, and this is a general question. In your travels and experiences, what do you find is the greatest challenge for alternative educators? And what is the pearl of wisdom you give them to address that? Thank you. Well, um, I think the greatest challenge of alternative educators is, is the is um, oftentimes the the challenges are so many that they can't quite uh, feel like the progress that they're making uh, is where they ought to be. Mm-hmm. And um, one of my therapies for people 
is to recognize uh, the successes that you do have. And um, we put together in Iowa and, and now as part of the International Association of Learning Alternatives website as well, a uh, publication called Success Stories in Alternative uh, Education Environments, where we celebrate uh, our successes with students and get that message out to people in the community that if it wasn't for the alternative learning environment situation, uh, this would not have happened kind of a deal. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would encourage you to take a look at that publication, Success Stories in Alternative Learning Environments. And um, uh, the thing that I do a lot uh, with people from alternative schools and programs is when we're having a conference or whatever, I, uh, I make sure that they pat themselves on the back. Um, what they really need to look at are the successes in their programs, and I just have them uh, raise their arm, uh, turn their palm to the rear, bend their arm at the elbow, and give themselves a pat on the back, and do it often <laughs> uh, because uh, there are a lot of successes. Uh, you just have so many challenges that uh, some those challenges can override your perspective and you look at it more negatively than positively, and uh, we can change that. Uh, by looking at our successes a little better. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you, Gail, for uh, for calling in and for your question. And we have uh, one more tool to uh, to get to. And, uh, Ray, you've provided our audience with a flow chart. Would you uh, tell us about this tool, please? Yeah, the uh, flow chart was developed uh, simply from a standpoint of uh, the belief that a picture provides a gestalt so everyone can understand the function of the school. Uh, we're doing so much in a school that oftentimes you can't conceive of everything that's going on, uh, especially as one individual, because there's so many things going on. So uh, what the progress flowchart does uh, is provides a picture of the total uh, uh, progress uh, and involvement that the student might have in the school and how they move on uh, or move into support services uh, and it also identifies the outcomes that you're after in a given program. And i just like to emphasize something about schooling, and that is that the outcome of schooling isn't uh, uh, all academic achievement. Uh, we need to look at outcomes that are numerous and different, and that a program, a given program, can have positive outcomes that are manifold, not just one. <laughs> Uh, so uh, the chart basically identifies how a student would come into a program, progress through the program, and what outcomes uh, you might be looking at as uh, identifying it as a successful experience for that student. So it gives you a total picture on one page of what could happen to a student over many year period of time. Uh, I believe and a picture is worth a thousand words because I've got to have the gestalt and then break down the parts. If you give me all the little parts and you don't give me the big picture, it's very, very difficult to put it together. So I recommend to folks to uh, chart out their school, put it into a picture, so that you can communicate this to students and communicate it to parents, communicate it to business people, and then they can understand. Uh, A picture really develops understanding. And that's the purpose of that tool, is to put something like that together so that you can communicate better. Um, the whole purpose of all these tools uh, that we have here basically is to identify the role of school and uh, to identify the purpose of school. Um, the key questions that really ought to be before everybody is, is your school about informing students or transforming students? Well, um, and is your mindset that all students are teachable or not? <laughs> and does the mindset of your students and the, match yours? In other words, if I'm a student and I want to learn, are you telling me through your actions and beliefs and whatever that I can learn? Uh, so uh, that's why we're after. That's what we're after here, and uh, really trying to get more of the essence of 
What Stephen Edwards is trying to tell us, uh, by using these tools, we can get after some of that. Well, I, th I think you've done an excellent job with that, and certainly it's very comprehensive with the flow chart, and it gives, does indeed give us a picture uh, of, um, of where we probably should be looking in terms of reforming education. Well, the hour has quickly flown by, and I'm sorry that we couldn't get to all of our callers, and I'm sure there's much more that we all want to know and ways to personalize instruction for our students. You know, yeah, Terry, um, we want to remind our listeners um, that all the resources reviewed today are listed on the website for this radio webcast. And if you're like Vivian and you just got hieroglyphics, please write us and we'll try to sort that out. But like uh, this radio webcast, like all our monthly programs, will be archived on our website. So you can go back and listen again. And you can re recommend this to your friends and colleagues uh, that they listen at their convenience. Uh, it's a great opportunity for professional development for an entire faculty or community group. Uh, Ray, I want to thank you. Uh, thank our guest for this month, uh, Dr. Ray Morley. Uh, you have given us plenty of information and resources to get started in, in this important area where students come first and curriculum comes second. It's now up to each of us to ex further explore what you've presented and begin to apply these solutions to our work and helping to end the dropout. And I want to add my thanks to you, Ray, for joining us today. It was terrific to have you with us. And, boy, you sure have shared us a ton of materials that are going to help us all. Keep up the good work back there, folks. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, right. to, uh, thanks also to all of you who are listening and participating. And um, remember that uh, we know why students are dropping out of school, and with research-based solutions, we can ensure that all students uh, will graduate. So tune in next month on the fourth uh, Tuesday in April when we will have Mr. Franklin Shargell, and the topic will be From at Risk to Academic Excellence, What Successful Leaders Do. So join us for that program, and we'll have our information on the website in just a couple weeks. Looking forward to having you join us next time.